of our Long Room 50th anniversary celebration, which marks the first major reinterpretation of the Long Room into an urban tavern period room, which opened to the public 50 years ago today on April 15th, 1971. Tonight, Kim Rice will join us for a presentation and discussion about the role of urban taverns during the 18th century and her time at Francis Tavern Museum. In 1983, she curated the exhibition Early American Taverns for the Entertainment of Friends and Strangers at Francis Tavern Museum. For this exhibition, she embarked on one of the biggest research projects in the museum's history, writing a book by the same name, which she offers an extensive history of urban taverns. Her work on this exhibition can still be seen today if you visit our long room. Rice's other award-winning exhibitions include A Share of Honor, Virginia Women, 1600 to 1945 for the Virginia Women's Cultural History Project, and Before Freedom Came, African American Life in the Antebellum South, organized for the Museum of the Confederacy. After the presentation, we will go into a discussion about her time and experiences at the museum. This presentation will be recorded and released as a special episode of Tavern Talks, a revolutionary podcast hosted by myself and Allie. Uh, as a reminder, please turn off your cameras if you do not wish to be recorded during this presentation. So please remember to leave your questions and comments, concerns in the question box, and I am going to hand it over to Kim. Kim, I think you're on mute. I am. I am. Now I'm now I'm back. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here and to be able to celebrate Francis Tavern and the new interpretation or reinterpretation of the long room. So when I worked, I worked on this project, as Mary just said, in the early 1980s, which is a long time ago. Um, and it was one of the first um, uh, sort of academic studies of taverns. There have been a lot of them that have followed this. Um, and the kind of research that we were doing was, was general. We were looking at um, the importance of taverns to early American life. Um, and we looked at mostly at colonial America and then sort of the early part of, of the you know, newly formed United States. So it took much of our research took place in 18th century America up until the early 19th century. And so we were lucky that the project was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities in both its planning and its implementation. Um, so that was a that was a very important thing. It probably couldn't have been done um, without their support. So I'm going to show you um, some general slides tonight, um, and we're going to talk about taverns generally, but also as, as they evolved in urban settings too. So let me see if I can share my screen. Uh oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, okay, so let me do, start the slideshow. Okay, and let's go. Yeah, here we go. Um, so as I said, our, our really our focus was on, on, um, on trying to put Francis Tavern in context, looking at the, the important history of this institution. And it really, the, the, the central role that taverns played in early American life had really not been recognized. Um, you know, I think we all think of them in this kind of context as uh, of this, you know, early engraving as sort of a place where people could socialize and drink, um, but they really had a much more important function than that. Um, they were really essential, whether we were talking about an urban setting or a rural setting, they were really the center of community life. And, and they're important for all the, the tentacles that reached into other parts of, um, society that were connected to taverns. Um, there's, a, there's a book by David Conroy that was published in 2002, and he's looking at political life in Massachusetts taverns. Um, but he has a really nice uh, way of sort of summarizing the importance of taverns. Um, and Conroy says taverns became 
over the course of the 18th century, a public stage upon which colonists resisted, initiated, and addressed changes in society, gradually redefining their relationships with figures of authority. So the, the tavern really served and, and, and is a kind of record of the way in which um, people's lives changed over time, over a hundred year time period um, that this project was looking at. The other important part of this, I think, is so you've got the community center part of the tavern, but there's also this function of the tavern as an institution, as an institution that services the development of travel and transportation in the United States. Um, and, it's part, and it's part of a travel network that really stretched from Maine to Georgia. And I remember um, actually in the map, sitting in the map division at the Library of Congress, doing some of the early research for this and looking at maps of the United States um, and beginning to realize the way in which the roads featured tavern after tavern and because travel moved in a much slower pace than it does today, there were taverns really literally every few miles along these major roadways that stretched um, uh, through the colonies. So they also had this important other function um, that you can see in, in the imagery as well. So, you know, that's it's important to remember too that Although more people were probably literate than you might imagine, it was a society where what you saw and what you heard was more important than what you read. So there are lots of cues in images of taverns um, and in the kinds of things that were made to reflect tavern life, like tavern signs, that were um, signals for people that told them what kind of tavern it was, um, that this was a tavern at all. Um, these are tavern signs were often hung like this, kind of extending out of the building so that they could be seen from pe by people who were riding by on horseback or walking on a roadway, um, going from one place to another. Um, and we had in the original exhibition, a lot of nice tavern signs. This is one of my favorite. It's from a Connecticut, it's from Clinton, Connecticut Tavern from about 1823, I think. So it's a little later, um, but it has this great stranger's resort um, sign welcoming people into the tavern, welcoming travelers. And then it actually on the backside makes an explicit reference to travel with this, um, not stagecoach, but this coach that's traveling by. So it was, it was a simply um, really, the signs were a very important way that people knew that this was a tavern. And we took the exhibition title from a sort of a combination of those signs and also what some of the tavern licenses say. Um, and I think it was, it's interesting how regulated taverns were. I mean, there certainly were illegal taverns that existed under the radar, and there were many of those in cities like New York. But for the most part in communities, um, people had to apply for licenses. Um, they had to be considered usually respectable citizens of the town. They had to provide um, funds to buy the license and to be able to keep the license up. So these are two examples of, the, in fact, the license became such a, a regular thing that they often were in this printed form, like the one on the right. Oops, I keep my mom. And the, uh, I think there's another um, part that's interesting is the tavern keeping was considered a respectable enough business for women. Um, and I saw uh, recently that someone said that one out of every five tavern keepers in the United States in this time period, in the early time period, was a woman. 
they frequently were the widows of, um, of men who'd been tavern keepers and they had learned the business that way. There were not a lot of women who started out desiring to be a tavern keeper, but they kind of fell into it, but they kept the business going and they, then they were largely, many of them were successful. So here you see two, a kind of satirical print of a, from, these are both English, from an English, um, you know, a disreputable female tavern keeper versus, um, you know, a nice, lovely woman who's handing the guy a, a, a mug of beer. Part of the regulation was a kind of supervision of tavern keepers and, you know, and the way in which they dispensed alcohol, which was certainly something that the business was centered around. I know that when we were putting together this show, and, and I'm sure there are more of these now, um, we only found one set of these measures that was made in America. Most of the ones that have survived are English. And this is a complete set that's in Colonial Williamsburg's holdings. And it ranges from the gallon down to the gill. And the gill is about four ounces. So it's about a quarter of a cup but sometimes rum and whiskey and, and strong alcohol was dispensed by the gill. And tavern keepers were required to keep these measures so that customers could see that they weren't being cheated, that they, that they were getting what they were paying for. Um, so they, are, they were something, as, as, as there are a lot of things, that the ordinary stuff has disappeared in large part. There's not a lot of it left. And this is something, the kind of thing that many, many tavern keepers would have had. Okay. And I should say, just to go back for a second, that even though taverns were regulated, even though tavern keepers were required to use measures and things like that, the overwhelming evidence is that they weren't very closely supervised. Um, there is a, Sharon Solinger has written a book about alcohol in the early Republic that says it was really the sort of um, less genteel taverns, and that would not include Francis, that, um, that sort of the authorities tended to keep um, a close eye on and tended to find. Um, the genteel taverns were, uh, it was possible to get away from, get away with most of, of uh, all different kinds of behavior without getting caught. Um, so we know that, you know, taverns were the site of, you know, government and political activity. They're very important to the American Revolution. Um, but I think we think of them mostly, and this is accurate, as places to consume alcohol and engage in all sorts of social behavior. Um, and this is a tavern group from the 1750s, uh, St is Staffordshire, so it's English, um, and it shows somebody pouring um, uh, probably some punch into a cup at the table. And this is one of the things that I remember when we had our symposia, somebody asked me, you know, how do you feel that, you know, is the, is the kinds of English things that, you know, um, material culture and visual images that you have to use to talk about taverns in the United States, is that accurate? And this really was, you know, an Anglo society from for really for in, into well into the 19th century. So I think with some reservations and some cautions, you, you can feel pretty secure using this kind of evidence to talk about how the tavern worked in the United States too. And so in fact, you know, here, is, here are some objects from Lovelace Tavern, which was um, right around the corner from Francis. Um, these are from the late 17th century, and they, sh they just, you know, um, emphasize alcohol. This is on the left is all um, different kinds of drinking material, you know, glasses, bottles, etc. And then on the right is the other thing that happened in, in taverns, and you see in almost every illustration, smoking. So you people were able to buy, buy white clay pipes from the tavern keepers and smoke in, the, in all the 
the different rooms of the tavern. So it was also part of the sort of social activity. Um, and I'll go back to drinking in a second, but um, we want to also just remind ourselves that, you know, taverns, particularly in urban areas like New York or Philadelphia or Boston, um, were places that were um, that were sources of valuable information for citizens. You know, here people communicated with each other. They learned what was going on. You know, it really relates to that oral culture. Um, and, and in taverns, they often, urban taverns, they often had access to newspapers. So this is a little bit later English print. This is probably from the 1830s. But on the left-hand side, you can see a stand with newspapers on it. Um, and I'll show you um, an illustration in a few minutes that also has shows the placement of newspapers in taverns. And we know that when, you know, important events leading up to the revolution and then during the revolution, also people heard in the taverns, they heard the Declaration of Independence being read, for example, in Philadelphia, Boston, and New York. Um, so, you know, this, they, they were communication centers um, of their time. Oops, sorry, wrong button. The other sorts of activities that took place, card playing, um, even though gambling was illegal, um, but in many taverns it took place and, and the authorities looked the other way. This is another English print of a cribbage uh, game. They were places where, and this is one of their most important functions, I think, too, is, is that, that they were, as entertainment centers, they sort of brought the world to you. Um, this is a, an, a, a Benjamin Henry Latrobe drawing, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy, but if you look up to the tavern sign to the right of it is an elephant, a small elephant named Lucy being transported um, from a rural tavern um, at night. And actually in this print also, or in this watercolor, you can see the great comet of 1811, may not be still in, in, the, in the part of this that I've um, excerpt, but it is, it, it, it was, um, it is remarkable the kinds of entertainment that taverns hosted. And many of urban taverns had, um, you know, magic lantern shows. Here's a magic lantern. Um, they had magicians performing tricks. They had many, many different kinds of performing animals, pigs that could count, for example, with their hoofs, um, singers, um, actors, all kinds of performances and exotic animals like Lucy. Um, so it was, the, you know, they had this, it was, they were not just about drinking, they also were about exposing people to a much wider culture. And they also were sites of um, all sorts of sociability and sort of evolving gentility. Um, this is a, an English print of a, of a dancing assembly. Um, this is a sort of Jane Austen-y type thing. Um, but taverns, urban taverns in particular, did host dancing assemblies, and they were an important part of genteel life in the cities. Um, this is, um, this was never built, but this is a Benjamin Henry Latrobe's um, proposed assembly hall for a hotel um, and tavern in Richmond, Virginia. And you can see this is a really fancy, elaborate kind of room, um, a little bit bigger probably than the long room. Um, and so it's sort of the next step after long rooms. But long rooms often were used for dancing assemblies and those sorts of kinds of social gathering. They also housed more regularly, though, activities that were sort of male only. Um, but occasionally women were invited. Okay, so I was interested back in the early 1980s um, in how 
the tavern and how taverns in general were furnished. And part of the um, part of the project, um, although not its whole focus, was to to look at some of the spaces within France's tavern, like the long room, and think about how perhaps the furnishings should be made a little bit more appropriate. So one of the things, so so to do that. I looked at a lot of newspaper advertisements for the sale of taverns that also included their furnishings, and then a large number of inventories for taverns. And it's interesting, you, you didn't always know, you know, the, the, um, an inventory might not always identify a space as a tavern, but there were certain things that then you would be able to, um, to correlate to tavern keeping, which would be things like large number of chairs, not so many tables, lots of drinking equipage. Um, those were became signs that it, this is probably a tavern space. And then I would then go after I left the archives, then I would go and go to city directories and things and be able to correlate whether this in fact had been a tavern or not. So there usually was not, um, most people did not invest in a lot of furniture. It was simple, it was durable, it was focused on um, you know, being able to seat people, but because life was more communal, there were not a lot of small tables. They were, they were generally larger tables, and you see this in, in paintings and prints as well, that could accommodate you know, larger groups of people. Tavern keepers bought prints, um, and then they spent most of their money really on alcohol and on accoutrements related to alcohol. And so I'll, we'll look, here is um, Hogarth's um, A Midnight Modern Conversation showing again, the, you know, a table, chairs, nothing fancy, um, but quite a lot of drinking equipment. Oops, sorry, we go back for a sec the first one. One thing they did do, um, and you and I would find these in the inventories too, um, because they were considered standing pieces of furniture, was they would buy and they would build these bars um, because it was important to be able to, to you know store all of the things that you needed for your business and also to be able to lock it up when you needed to. So these, these built bars often had grills that could be moved down and locked um, to keep the alcohol safe. So this is a Crimmel, um, John Lewis Crimmel painting of, I think it's 1814 or 1815, called an American Inn, I think. Um, it's in Toledo, the um, art museum in Toledo. And it, you can see um, there's kind of a stagecoach outside the doors. Um, so the mail is being delivered, somebody's carrying in supplies. So this is a country scene. This is not a city, but this, but it still suggests the sort of thing you would find anywhere. Um, there are prints tacked up on the wall and down on either side of the bar sort of slanted are the newspapers. Um, and advertisements were posted on the bar and on the wall as well. Nothing fancy, things were kind of just slapped up, but they were there for people um, to read. And, you know, this is something that people really went to taverns, again, get trying to get that kind of information. And this is another criminal. This is a watercolor that's in the Library of Congress. Um, Again, showing a rural tavern, you know, it's a sort of an evening entertainment, but now you can see the bar from the side. Um, and so it, this is this is not the same tavern as in the Earl is in the painting, but this is a common form that you see over and over again in taverns is this sort of corner bar um, that also had grills that could be locked up.
So the kinds of things you find in the inventories, you find lots of mugs and jugs and flagons used for serving beer, beer and ale. Um, and the one on the right is um, stoneware, glazed to stoneware, and similar stoneware like this has been found in archaeological sites in cities all over the East Coast, um, including also in domestic sites like Mount Vernon. Here's another bar scene, um, but it's it's I put it in here as a reminder to myself, I think, that punch was really the thing that most people drank. And it, it is the, the thing that we associate certainly with urban taverns. Um, this, is a, this is a detail from um, John Greenwood's Sea Captains Carousing in Suriname, um, which is in the St. Louis Art Museum. But it has, it shows um, the, uh, the slave, probably likely slave, is passing a punch bowl to someone. But you can see the, the, um, the two sugar cones that are on the first shelf because sugar was an essential um, ingredient in punch because punch is, is literally rum or brandy, sugar, water, and some fruit, either lemon or lime sometimes orange, just squeezed in there, but it's mostly alcohol and, um, and sugar. So it's very potent and people um, drank it in punch bowls of all different sizes. Um, so here we see people drinking um, and this is, a, this is the Hogarth again with a big punch bowl in the center, wine glasses. It's, it was interesting to me that people drank punch in wine glasses very frequently. They didn't have punch cups necessarily. Um, and, there, and you can see they're smoking in this too. Here's a Delft punch bowl, and that was sort of the common form that you see. And then, the, then um, this one is actually a large sized Delft punch bowl from Colonial Williamsburg's collection. And then this little beaker shows a man sitting with a much smaller kind of punch bowl and cup next to him. And then these things you do find, um, you might think that these are only found in the domestic settings, but you do find punch ladles um, like the one on the left. And they always, you know they're punch when they have this deep bowl. And then um, the punch strainers, which tavern keepers did use. Um, and I'm assuming probably not always silver, like this example, but they would they came in all different kinds of forms and came in other metals too. So the punch, the punch is in in, as I said, these many different bowls. Here's an example of a wine, the kind of wine glass you find as well. So this is a uh, another detail from this um, sea captain's carousing in Suriname, but one of the things that I loved and I got so fascinated by was how people drank punch, because it really speaks to the communal nature of the tavern. Um, and this is something that you see changing by the end of the 18th century, but earlier, and so this is the mid 1750s, 1760s, you, people are drinking right out of the bowl. And, and, and passing it then to someone else. So this isn't just, you're not hogging the big punch bowl yourself, you're sharing it with someone else or someone else's uh, at the table. And um, occasionally, it, it's sometimes hard to find the scenes where people are actually drinking out of the punch bowl, but I have found a few. And it, it just really um, is a terrific example of the way taverns worked and the way they were this, um, central uh, institution for sort of community building um, and sociability and bringing people together. And yeah, here he is again, sloppily drinking out of the punch bowl. And then, and this guy is pointing at him and I'm assuming he's probably next to get the punch bowl. So this is a, a um, an English print of um, the ladies of Edington 
in this is right before the revolution signing um, an agreement not to drink tea, but one of the things they're going to drink instead is punch. And if you see in the back, um, here is another example of someone drinking directly out of the punch bowl. So sometimes they were ladling it into a wine cup, but more likely people were just taking the bowl and drinking it themselves. And she is about to pass it as well to somebody else. So let's um, pause for a second and then just talk about some, I, let me give you one example of, an, um, of a way in, an urban tavern, which was really at the center of the social, economic and political life of a city. And this is the city tavern in Philadelphia. It's the it's the building on the extreme left with the awning, um, and these kinds of city taverns, which um, spring up in many urban places, and I think Francis probably falls into this same category. They were built particularly or used particularly to serve what we would think of as polite society. So they were really not for the riffraff, they were really for um, the better established clientele. Um, and it that could include travelers as well, you know, or transients, but, the, but they also attracted their own, um, you know, their own regulars as well who lived in the neighborhood and who were well-to-do. So the city, when the city tavern opened in 1773, it was established by 53 city residents who, um, who put money together to, to build and operate it. Um, and it was described in its day as a large and commodious tavern, which it certainly was because it was uh, it was three stories high and it had a kitchen, a bar, two coffee rooms because coffee was increasingly important in taverns, um, three dining rooms, a long room, um, five lodging rooms um, and a servants quarters for those lodging rooms. John Adams, who was there for um, the constitutional convention and other things um, called the city tavern the most genteel tavern in America in its day. And its long room, which is a little bit like Francis, um, hosted the first 4th of July celebration in America. And it was, was about 50, almost 50 feet long. It's a big room. Um, and it had lots of other kinds of activity that took place in it. Well, I'll show you a bill from uh, from an entertainment that took place there in a sec. And the city tavern um, in the seventeen late 1780s, 1789, so right around the, the time of the Constitutional Convention, the front rooms became um, the Merchant's Coffee House and Exchange. The, you know, the tavern part continued as well. So these things, the kind of the merchant's activity was beginning to be sort of segregated into special spaces within taverns. And that happened in New York as well. Um, and this is a Latrobe image, I believe, Latrobe of, of the tavern from, um, from the 1830s. And in 1834, the roof burns. So the tavern becomes, um, it's no longer, we're no longer able to use it. And then eventually in, 18, in the 1850s, it was torn down. But during the bicentennial um, of the revolution back in the 70s, the, the National Park Service reconstructed the tavern. So that, that photograph of the long room is a reconstruction, but it's based on original descriptions and other things known of the building. And on sadly, this has been operating as a restaurant in Philadelphia ever since, but it did not survive the pandemic. It, it closed recently, and I don't know if it's going to be able to be reopened or not um, because tourism has been so, so down for so, for so many things, so many museums. So here is a, a this is um, a, um, 
translation of a transcription of a bill for an um, entertainment at the City Tavern in honor of George Washington um, that was held September 15th, 1787. But it's a very good uh, indication of just exactly how much could happen in an urban tavern in one of these special events. So it 55 gentlemen had dinner um, with fruit, that's probably for the drink, um, with relishes and olives, et cetera. And then 54 bottles of Madeira, 60 of claret, eight of old stock, 22 bottles of porter, eight of cider. This is just, this is perfect in that this really gives you a sense of the kinds of things and the amounts that taverns were able to serve. Um, you know, 12 bottles of beer and then seven large bowls of punch and the sugar uh, cigars, candles, and then quite a lot of things, decanters, wine glasses and tumblers were broken. And often when, when um, things were broken in taverns, uh, the clients had to pay. There were also musicians, the servants got dinner. And then afterwards there was claret, Madeira and more punch. Uh, totaling about 89 pounds, uh, four pence, two pence, probably, I, I'm not sure, uh, but um, someone who transcribed this estimated that this bill was about um, $18,000 today. So this was a big deal. Um, and the first troop of uh, Philadelphia City served with Washington um, in a number of battles and at Valley Forge. So they were closely associated with him and with the revolution. So I, you know, we, we've talked, um, I'm just gonna assume that a number of you have seen the long room at Francis Tavern. Um, and so one of the things that we were trying to do was to think about what was, the proper sort of furnishings for the long room. And one thing that, that did seem to appear um, in inventories and in, uh, and, in, and in newspaper accounts was that they often had very long tables. So they could accommodate a lot of, the, um, a lot of these assemblies and other kinds of uh, recreational events that took place in them. So this English print was the kind of thing we looked at. Um, and you can see this, this guy is making punch, by the way, by squeezing the fruit in. Um, and the other thing that was interesting and, and came directly from the city tavern was John Adams mentioned that the city tavern installed curtains, red curtains across the rooms um, so that people could dine privately. And that was the first time that I saw that reference. And then I began to recognize it in other things that I had either missed or, or found subsequently that, the, that life in the tavern was changing and there was a, a growing emphasis on privacy, on not being in these big communal settings and these big tables. I mean, it was fine for an event in the long room, um, but, for the most part, in the in the bar rooms, there began to be what people began to look at ways in which these spaces could be more segregated. Um, and there's the curtain in the back that could be um, extended over the uh, the, the um, sort of in front of the seating, so you couldn't see people. And you see in some of the um, prints of English coffee houses that are coming at the same time or right around the end of the 18th, early 19th century, that booths are being built so that people don't have to eat with people that they don't know. They're eating with, with their friends. Um, and there is this, you know, this is a marker of a change that's taking place, that tavern life is becoming less communal um, and less maybe open and more, um, and more about just the individual uh, experience that, that's happening. Um, and this, yes, here's another close-up of one of, of these booths. And then lastly, let me just end with um, this wonderful painting 
of Francis from Francis Guy's um, 1797. This is the Tontine Coffee House, um, which is stood at the corner of Wall and Water Street, so right near Francis Tavern. And Tontines were um, were investments that a group of individuals would make, and they were usually of a limited number. Um, and then they would build something like this and, and they would share in the profits of it. Um, and the Tontine Coffee House was really at the center of the merchant community in New York at the, at the end of the 18th century. It didn't really stay as an exclusively merchant space for very long because by the early 19th century, it had be, the building was now housing a tavern, a hotel, and a newspaper publisher. So it became, it, it actually became more of an ordinary urban tavern um, within 20 years of 15 years of its creation. But it's, it, it gives you a, a really great sense, this painting, and it's also very large when you see it in person, um, of just of the activity on the streets in, in the area around Francis Tavern and what a lively, incredible, incredibly vibrant place Lower Manhattan was um, in the 18th and 19th century. So that's my last image for tonight. And I hope I haven't gone on too long. That's all right. Uh, okay. There were many, many interesting questions. The conversation was quite fascinating to watch everybody. Okay, so I maybe we can talk about some of those. I or... think it's definitely safe to say everybody enjoyed this conversation. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I'm glad. That's great. Um, we, well, you spoke a little bit about punch bowls and the liquor consumption and the types of and the types of cups that they were using. But can you talk a little bit more about the food that might have been served at a tavern? Oh gosh, you know, I think. In, a, in an urban tavern, again, these more um, sort of respectable establishments like Francis Tavern, I mean, the food was probably pretty good. I mean, we know that Sam Francis <laughs> yeah. Washington later hired him to be his cook. So he was, he was obviously accomplished um, culinary uh, uh, individual and I would imagine that the, the kind of food he served. So, you know, they served, um, they served oysters, they served chops, they served roasted chickens, they served all sorts of things like that. In the, in the transportation, um, you know, in these travel taverns, the food was much less good. And when you read all these travel accounts, they often, yeah, no vegans, that's very true. <laughs> they often comment on how terrible the food is and yeah. that they're paying, you know, they're paying for, you know, food that's pretty mediocre. They were sometimes just sharing in what a family was eating itself. So during your research, were you able to find anything like a receipt or a copy of some sort from Francis? I no. No, okay, so it's not just me who's never been able to find anything. No, okay. that was a big disappointment. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, not yet. I mean, I, I wouldn't give up on that, but- I have not learned that lesson. <laughs> one, of, one of the things about uh, that's sort of sad is that, um, and you, you've probably heard this story before, but New York City got rid of a lot of the colonial records. Yeah. And um, there is a guy who I, don't know if he's still alive, but he was alive at the time that we were working on this project, a historian at Queens College who actually, you know, people would call him who worked in City Hall and say, they're dumping a lot of stuff today. And he would go to the dump and save things. Oh. He saved a lot of colonial records. And that's where I found a lot of tavern stuff was through him. And, but there wasn't anything from Francis Tavern, unfortunately, very so, little. Sometimes they say New York City is the best place in the world. And then you hear things like that and you immediately just want to move. I know this, well, that <laughs> was a very, you know, short-sighted at the time. I mean, I think that it, this was probably the seventies maybe that they were doing that, but, mm -hmm. and they just didn't have their, 
they thought they didn't have room for everything. So they got, then maybe they thought the early stuff wasn't as important, but obviously it is, right? I know so, the, yeah, that was crazy. They're still opening up or they are in the process of maybe opening up some Dutch files in the municipal archives. Oh, too. that's great. Yeah. I think there's a lot there, but but it was um but it was it was frustrating too <laughs> but it imagine. was wonderful to discover this um this you know personal archives that I, that I believe is at Queens College now mm -hmm. that where is all this material that he saved <sighs> so I never no I never <laughs> found anything uh you know directly from Francis which was um I was able to find a copy of a receipt from George Clinton after the evacuation day banquet. So it wasn't, it was like a copy of a copy, I think, or like part of his bigger ledger book. And I was like, this is the best I'm going to get. And we're just going to accept it and move on. We're going to post it on the website. And this is what we got. But hopefully, you know, something will show up eventually. Eventually. Right. Yeah. 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 It's I've been clinging to find some sort of like Samuel Francis, Francis touchstone for the last five years. And it's, I will find one. <laughs> I'm sure you will find something eventually. Um, but somebody asked just what my favorite part of it was. And, you know, it was, um, it was really traveling around. I, I got to, this is the, you know, this is sort of the downside of the internet now is that when you do projects like this, um, you probably don't feel like you have to go as as far as you do as you know and you don't feel you necessarily have to travel in person mm -hmm. to all these archives because a lot of stuff has been digitized but um i was i spent a year um traveling to from you know boston to um to to savannah looking at tavern material in different historical societies and archives. And that was really my favorite part of it was just um, that sense of you're sort of on a detective mission and you're, you're finding <laughs> things all the time and then you're trying to figure out what they mean. And it was, it, that was really, that was very rewarding. And I was able to use that same methodology in a lot of the projects I worked on after that. Yeah, just so we're clear, everybody, Kim has my dream job. <laughs> it is getting to research things, going into these archives and physically not being on my computer all day and finding all of those wonderful touchstones. So I am interviewing a Rolling Stones in my mind, a member of the Rolling Stones in my mind. But Daniel, you're right. I mean, a lot of stuff has not been digitized yeah. yet. I mean, it's really true. And I and the National Archives, for example, is a place where there is a lot of tavern material. And none of it, or I, I can say pretty certainly almost none of it has been digitized. So there is a lot of stuff still out there and there's a lot more to unpack and understand. And, and that's what's really, that is what's really fun and exciting about these kinds of jobs. Yeah, it's, it's even at the museum where our curator is slowly in the process of digitizing our collection so that people have more access to them instead of kind of having to request yeah. to come here or us going through everything and maybe scanning something to you later. Um, somebody asked a really good question. Could you speak a bit, whoop, can you speak a bit more about major political events and balls that occurred at taverns in the 18th uh -huh. century? Because that goes back to like the evacuation day banquet and Washington's farewell and why these were such big community spaces and why everybody gravitated towards these spaces. I mean, there were these, they happened everywhere um, and I don't, are you still doing um, sort of a reenactment of some of these things at Francis Tavern? Because that is, that those are, that's a great way to kind of understand how these, these events worked. Um, and Gatsby's Tavern in Alexandria, which is a, you know, which also has a George Washington birthday ball, which was held mm -hmm. originally um, in the early 19th century in Alexandria, and they have continued to hold it. And I think those things are very cool. And we they still... really do speak to the, the political part of it, which is something that has a lot has been written about. Mm -hmm. If you read the, um, the book by, um, 
oh, I don't know, I'm forgetting, David, um, about Massachusetts and the taverns, that is mostly about political uh, life and political activities that took place in taverns. And that's where a lot of the focus of people's research and writing has been. And I was a little less interested in that. I mean, I, we, <laughs> I talked about it, you know, it's part of the book, but my, you know, I've been around a long time and this was a time where the new social history was still very much in play. And so my interest was really in people that were, had been kind of marginalized by history. And that's really what sort of set the Tavern Project going forward was looking for those stories about those people in their lives. Yeah, we still do our annual Washington's farewell reenactment. So we have uh, last year because we were, we couldn't allow people in the long room. We have a restriction of two whole people. Um, <laughs> oh, you we, mean because of the pandemic? Because or, of the pandemic, we couldn't wow. open it up for our regular in-person presentation. We created a, what I'm calling a motion picture event uh, <laughs> where we had it pre-recorded and we were able to get more people into the room. So for the first time we had a Benjamin Talmadge and a Henry Knox alongside oh, Washington. Oh, that's cool, wow. Yeah. yeah, it was one of my more favorite projects to definitely work on. Um, I know we, you spoke a little bit about the role of women in taverns and how it was primarily widows. Uh, with my Francis Tavern research, I've found out that after his death, his wife Elizabeth went on to own a tavern. Hmm. That's and very she interesting. Was just like, I'm just going to go on with my life. My husband is gone. He opened 16 taverns and I'm going to do my thing. That's great. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that it, you know, if you'd, um, it just shows that in the tavern keeping really was almost like a family business in yeah. that it's single, it seldom was really a sole proprietor that was running things and that um, men really needed their wives and able to, you know, to run a really successful tavern. Now, I somebody asked about the history of the building, which I really, you know, I can't go into too, but do you have information on the website perhaps? Uh, yeah. For or the Allie? building in general? Yeah, because oh. it has a very interesting history, definitely. And it, particularly also after the sons buy it at the end of the 19th century, it's one of the, it's one of the first kind of colonial revival museums. So, mm -hmm. well, I put together the Preserving the Past tour. So that's a the expansive 300 year history of the building. So there's a digital lecture for anybody who wants to see that on our YouTube page. It's probably okay. uploaded on. Great, great. Um, so usually if there's a weird history building question, the staff refers to me, which is horrifying <laughs> that I know every brick in the building. Um, but if you want to learn a little bit more about the long room itself specifically, me and Allie were able to put together uh, a long room archive, which is located on the website. Uh, in part in in part for the celebrations. So it, it shows all of the different people who ever came into the room and important markers like Henry Holt using the long room as a dance hall in the 1730s. And it's something it's really interesting when you think about it because we're I, you're so in tune of Washington came here. This is a revolutionary war. Don't go past 1770 something, 1783. Okay. But then you realize that like before Samuel Francis bought the building, it was a dance hall and it was a storage unit. And then after he sold the building, it becomes offices for the government. And it becomes this common space for a boarding home and it, all of these other wonderful functions of it, it, truly a community space is the best way I can always put it to people who come visit the museum. So if you can't visit in person or if you haven't, you know, hopefully you will be able to visit in person if you haven't done that, because it is, it is a very cool place really. And, um, but, but the website is great now and has a lot of information on it. And so go to the website <laughs> if you have specific interests in, in Francis Tavern, yeah. And Mary's lecture, Allie is just putting it up there. Yeah, always feel free to email me. You can find my email on the website. I love weird questions like that. Yes, I love you pointing should. people Definitely. to other new places. <laughs> Because there aren't that many taverns left in New York. So no. even though it, it was, you know, could have even been the tavern capital of, you know, 18th century America, there's, there's, a, there's only a tiny bit of that still remaining. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. What, when you were putting together the long room, because it was part of this museum wide exhibition. Yeah. When you were putting together the long room, when you were doing all of this research, was there one key component that you wanted to make sure was definitely added or updated to make it as historically accurate as possible? Like the most iconic thing in that room is our long table. Yes, right, right. That was something that we did add. And I think one of the, you know, we, we were not able to rebuild any part of the space mm -hmm. at that time. Um, and so I... I, I'm trying to remember, is the bar still there? there the bar is, is still there, the bar, yeah. The bar is not accurate. I mean, there- <laughs> We know I, that. <laughs> you know that. But I was, you know, we kind of tried to think of all kinds of ways that we could make it more accurate. Um, and that, and that's what, you know, in a way, it, I suppose it it's nice in that it shows the kind of continuum mm -hmm. from the sun's early occupation of the site forward. Yeah. And they, you know, they deserve kudos for preserving because if they had not saved this building, it would not be be it would be a skyscraper today. Yeah. You know? Skyscraper, parking lot, you know, all the traditional New York City transitions. Yes, yeah. and in the tavern is is it three it is three stories, I think, or is it actually four? Restaurant, long room, third, fourth, four floors were. So it's the building, the original structure was three floors. And then during Mercero's restoration, he added that fourth floor, which is a private conference room and library. Yeah. Right. Right. I, I saw me and a few other coworkers on screen counting in our heads, the yeah. amount of floors in the building, because the thing is with a five complex building, if you've ever visited the museum, you know, every time you go through a weird set of stairs or you go down a ramp of some sort, you're entering into another building because none of them were leveled as they were slowly squished together. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they're a mul it's a multi-building site, which yeah. makes it really kind of interesting. And somebody is asking me, women did go to taverns, um, but not on, not, I would say not on a respectable women, not on a regular basis. And they not on their own, right? Not on their own, yeah. no. But when they were invited to something like an event at front, mm -hmm. like an, an assembly of some kind, for example, then they, they would be there. Yeah. Um, but not, yeah, not unaccompanied. That's a good way of putting it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were women, I'm sure, in taverns, but they were not, um, yeah, they were the, the dis, not as respectable type. Right? I definitely attribute it to a no shirt, no shoes, no service kind of a bar. When people <laughs> ask me, you know, who was coming here, what would they bring, who, what was going on? I was like, you know, it's a tavern. It, when the when the fourth graders come in, I kind of attribute it to like a, a bar meets a Starbucks because there's, <laughs> you know, free Wi-Fi in a bathroom and the, the tavern because there's food and there's beer and you can play your games. But like, also kind of hanging out in your friend's basement kind of a situation because they're always looking for like, well, what was it? And it's it, the, this common space was just truly such a conglomerate of different little things put together. Yes, right, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a good, I think that's a great way of uh, trying to get them to see a comparison between you know today and the past, which yeah. is you know, hard to do for kids particularly. Yeah, they look at me like I'm ancient sometimes. And I'm like, no, I grew up without a cell phone. It's wild. I know. I mean, there were no computers when I did this project. Yeah. We are nearing at the end of our time. Um, I am going to end with the question that I ask everybody who comes, I was going to say comes through these doors, but ends up on Zoom with me, is that if you could dine at Francis Tavern with anybody, who would it be and why? Ah. It always stumps you. Alexander Hamilton. I would, yeah, I would say George Washington, just because I'm curious about what he was really like. Yeah. <laughs> and someone, someone from yeah. the Culper ring, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Major John Andre, a real dish. Thank you, Renee. <laughs> I also say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was good looking. Right. They did them good justice on turn, I will say. That was that was pretty decent casting. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we need a Francis Tavern something. Um, have you been in any, 
have has the, the tavern been in any films or tv shows um we i'm trying to think because there have we've it's been rented out a few times right Allie? yeah in 2018 an episode of billions the hbo show filmed yeah, um in the tavern okay and then we've had we have news people come in uh, most recently the show what made america great came in and filmed in the long room they were talking about the cult perspiring they also filmed the talmage memoir and that aired back in february oh cool mm-hmm. that's great and our motion picture of washington sparrow <laughs> i'm sticking with that title because it makes it really cool all right we are unfortunately out of time this was a wonderful presentation i again feel so honored to be able to speak to you because if anybody really wants this book that's really oh. highlighted <laughs> in my collection that i refer to almost every day at my time here you can purchase this at our website at our gift shop it is a very great resource in that I always ask myself, what would Kim do when I'm oh. stumped on a citation? That's so nice. I really <laughs> appreciate that. And thank you everybody for, yes. for sticking with me. That was fun. Fun for me to revisit a project that, um, that I love doing. Hmm. Warms our heart. Yeah. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> With Thank everything, <laughs> with reopening and getting everything back to normal. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. It was an absolute pleasure. We're so glad that you wanted to go on this tavern journey with us. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see familiar faces and welcoming new names. So with that, I will wish everybody a happy evening. Hopefully, hopefully if you're in New York City, it stops raining and you get to enjoy the weather for the next couple of days. But if not, come visit us. If not, come email me and I'll answer your questions and have a great night. Good night, everybody. Good Thank night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.